Isaiah. If you are going to be running uh, cross country, uh, final call for that announcement. Get with uh, Sister Lori and Coach Lori. Let her know that you're going to be participating, okay? I think most of you, a lot of you forgot that announcement Sunday, so we'll give you another opportunity, all right? Praise the Lord. Everybody say cross country. Amen, amen. Okay, in the uh, prophet Isaiah, we have covered the structure of the book. We covered the geopolitical setting, which was uh, who were the powers in existence at that time as far as in reference to Judah and Israel. And we covered the commission of the prophet Isaiah in the sixth chapter and a little bit on Emmanuel in the seventh chapter. So now we're going to begin in the first chapter and uh, we're going to go up through the sixth chapter tonight, give you a survey uh, of these first few chapters of the book of Isaiah. All right? Amen. Somebody say, praise the Lord. Lord. All right, verse 1, it says, The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, the kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord has spoken. I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Amen. Father, we come before you right now, we ask your blessing to be upon the reading of your holy word, depending on your inspiration tonight, God, to declare it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Before we get into the study tonight, I would encourage you uh, to maybe have pen in hand and something to write with. You, uh, you may even want to write in your Bible some notes as we cover these chapters, all right? We're going to be studying the prophet Isaiah from a historical uh, point of view and also an eschatological point of view. That means end times, okay? So uh, there are a lot of very interesting things that we're going to be covering. To begin with, the Bible says the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amos. The word vision is a, means the message. It is the message that God gave the prophet Isaiah. His prophecy is to uh, Judah. Okay, so the southern kingdom, specifically Judah. Now Micah uh, is a contemporary to Isaiah. His prophecy is very similar. His prophecy is to both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom is the ten tribes. The southern kingdom is the two tribes. Okay? Uh, But Isaiah's prophecy specifically is for Judah. Okay, everybody understand that? Now, in verse 2, after it declares who the kings are that he prophesied in, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord has spoken. Now you see the same thing if you go to the book of Micah. You'll see the same thing in that first chapter. In fact, let's just do that so I can show you. In uh, Micah chapter 1, in verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord that came to Micah, the Morristite, in the days of Jotham, Ahaz, Hezekiah, kings of Judah, which he saw concerning Samaria and Jerusalem. You see, his prophecy is to both kingdoms. Okay, the ten tribes and the two tribes. And notice the kings are the same. Verse 2, Hear, all ye people, hearken, O earth, and all that therein is. Let the Lord God be witness against you, the Lord, from His holy temple. So you see the likeness of those prophecies. All right. Verse 2 says, Hear, O heavens. Now the first thing we need to understand is that this word here doesn't mean that when Isaiah began to preach that it's a passive thing that he's doing. Okay? The word that is used here is Shema in the Hebrew. Shema. To hear. That means that the message of Isaiah is going to be very loud. Okay? 
It is not going to be a passive preaching. It's going to be uh, very loud in the sense this. What God is saying is that we're at a place now where we can't play games anymore. Okay, not that God ever plays games. But the point being is on that word here, Shema, it means we're past that point now. And what God is about to say, He wants us to get it because it is very important. And it is not going to be something that's just passively spoken. It's going to be so loud you could hear that prophet preaching for miles. Okay? Now, sometimes we get loud here. I get loud sometimes when I preach. Probably way too loud. You know, we have a microphone system. They didn't have that in those days. But sometimes the anointing comes on and it's so, so strong and so powerful that the message is not a passive message. It is something that is active. It's, it's something that must be shouted. It's something that must be loud. Okay? And I will just say this. If some of you have problems with that, I don't mind if you bring earplugs. You know, when I go to the gun range, we have ear earplugs. We don't just wear earplugs. We wear ear muffins, muffs, you know. I mean, big old muffs. To... All right, so I'm not really advising you to bring ear muffs. But if you want to bring earplugs, you can. Because I'm not going to apologize for getting loud at times. Because that is... And, and I'm, not, I'm not really just trying to get loud. It's just sometimes the anointing is like that. And that is the kind... So you'll understand... That is the kind of anointing that was on the prophet Isaiah. It is a word that is to be declared with loudness. It is a word that is saying to the people, God is saying something. It's uh, games. It's not time for games. God is very serious about what He's about to say. Shema. Same thing. Same word is used in Micah chapter 1 and verse 2. Okay? So He is shouting His message. It's an active message. He's preaching to get the attention of the people. God is saying what I'm about to say to this through this man is very, very, very important. We're past the time. Amen. It's time to get serious, basically, is what the word is. That little word here, Shema, has a lot in it. God is saying it's time to get serious. It's time to stop playing games. And so he says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. He's calling the heavens and the earth to be a witness. He says this, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. And so the indictment is laid out here. The terms are laid out. These are covenant terms, okay? And he says... First of all, he likens his people to his children. Like a son who would talk to his father. Or the father would talk to his son. It's a very, very intimate relationship. God says, I have nourished and brought up children. He said, I've taken care of them. I nourished them. I brought them up. They're like children to me. And I'm like their father. And then he begins to record just how far they had gone. How bad it had become. He's such a good father. He nourished, he took care of them, and then he will begin to record just how bad it was. He says, I've nourished and brought up children. They have rebelled against me. And again, this is a covenant term. What he's saying is, my children have broken the covenant that I have made with them. And because they have broken the covenant that I have made with them, they no longer have a right to the promises of the covenant. So these are very, very serious things that God is speaking through to the prophet. He moves from the picture of a family to the picture of animal kingdom. He says this, he says, The ox knoweth his owner and the ass his master's crib, 
but Israel doth not know, my people doth not consider. So he says, look, you think about the ox and you think about the donkey. The Bible says here, uh, the ass. These animals are known as stupid animals. Okay? I hope Ryder didn't hear that. For some reason, he came back to us and he, he likes that word stupid. And so if he hears me say it, he's going to want to say it more. But that's the truth. These animals are known for their stupidity. Okay? And so God goes on and says about His people, He says, they're more ignorant than an ox or a donkey. He said, because an ox and a donkey knows the master's crib. They know where they get their food. You know, the, the crib for the church is the Word of God, is the church. And he says, basically, if you can receive it this way, he said, these people are the clowns of the universe. He said, they're, they're dumber than an ox and a donkey. Why is that? Because they don't know and they don't consider. Which means they don't want to know and they don't want to consider the crib, how God takes care of them. And then he begins to again continue to record and in the indictment here how they've broken the covenant. He says they're a sinful nation laden with iniquity. He's, they're just loaded down with sin. They're just heavy with guilt. They're like they're carrying a burden around with them all the time and that burden is sin. They're just loaded down with guilt. And then he said, a seed of evildoers. This is God speaking. He said, they're a seed of evildoers or literally a brood of evildoers. He said, they're like a nest of evil. In the New Testament, the term is used concerning snakes, brood of vipers. God is saying about these people, He said, they're just a nest of serpents. He said, children that are corruptors, everything they touch, they corrupt themselves, and everything they touch they corrupt. They have forsaken the Lord. Now they, not only that, all these things, but they've apostatized. They've turned their back on God. You know, you can say, well, if they forsake the Lord, it's not like they're looking at the light backing away. It's one thing to backslide. There are some people who backslide. That means they're looking at the light and they're going this way away from the light. But these people didn't just backslide. They turned their back and walked away from the light. They forsook God. And they have provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger. And they have gone away backwards. So forsaking the Lord, backsliding away from God, they're in a horrible, horrible state. Notice the term there in verse 4. The Holy One of Israel is the one they have forsaken. The Holy One of Israel. Kodesh Israel. The Holy One of Israel. That term, Holy One of Israel, speaks of God and it speaks of the Messiah. We know Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Christ. He is God. But that term speaks of Jesus Christ, speaks of God, speaks the Messiah. Verse 5, Why should you be stricken any more? You have revolted more and more. The whole head is sick and the whole heart is faint. He said they're sick in the head. they got psychological problems. I mean, it makes sense to me. You've got a, such a good father like this 
And these children are acting like they're acting. They've got to be sick in the head. He said their whole head is sick. They got psychological problems. This is God saying this. The heart is faint. They've just been stricken. Verse 6, from the sole of the foot even unto the head. There's no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises, putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. So now God is saying this, you're like a prisoner of war. And no doubt the prophet Isaiah has in mind Assyria taking the people of God into captivity and has smitten them. Okay? Okay, I, I, I would advise you to pay attention. I don't want to call you by name. This is not funny. Okay? So what he's saying here is this, is that these people have been whipped and beaten so badly because of the captivity. See, at this point, the Assyrians have already invaded into the land. And we'll see that in verse 7. They've already started moving toward Judah. They're at the, basically at the gates of Judah. They're fixing the Assyrians about to destroy them completely. And so when Isaiah sees the people of God, they have now become prisoners of war. And we talked about how the Assyrians were so cruel. The Assyrians were cruel. They were cruel like maybe modern day ISIS would be. When you think about the Assyrians, you need to think about the terrorist. You need to think about ISIS. You need to think about being captured by the terrorist and being treated brutally. That's what God is saying is happening to His people. He says, when you look at them, they're prisoners of war. It's like the terrorists have got a hold of them. Sad. He said, your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land strangers devoured in your presence. See, this is a picture. We already see now the land has been devoured. The enemy is invading. The enemy is attacking. They're in war and, and everything's on fire. Historically, they're right at the gates of the city of Jerusalem. Amen. The Bible says, and, and as we continue, and it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard. The daughter of Zion is speaking of the little towns around Jerusalem. It's speaking about little towns like Bethlehem. The daughter of Zion. The little towns around Jerusalem. These little towns around Jerusalem as Assyria is making their invasion. It says they, there is left as a cottage and a vineyard or lodge and a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. And he goes on and explains what that means. He says there's just a few left. Just a small remnant is left. And if God had not left them, they would have been as Sodom and Gomorrah, completely wiped out. He said, but the daughter of Zion is like a cottage in a vineyard, just a little small hut. A little small cut cottage, a lodge in a garden of cucumbers. It's a besieged city. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. The Lord of hosts. Another term you need to be familiar with in the prophet Isaiah. The Lord of hosts. Yahweh. Sabiot. Some say it's Titzbaot in the Hebrew. The Lord of hosts. That means... He's the Lord of armies. If it hadn't been for the Lord of armies, there wouldn't have been anything left. If God hadn't intervened as Assyria was making its way, getting ready to destroy Judah, if God hadn't intervened and stopped them, even Jerusalem would have been overtaken. Those little towns were 
so devastated that only a few, only a remnant of people were left in those towns, the daughters of Zion. Verse 10, again, Shema, hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. He calls His own city, His own people, Sodom. Spiritually speaking, they're like Sodomites. Give ear unto the law of our God, you people of Gomorrah. See, you leaders, you should be leading the people of God, declaring the Word of God to them, but you're not. You're not leading them. You're not teaching them the Word of the Lord like you're supposed to. Today in Israel, they are literally trying to pass laws that will put the mention of God out of their schools. Pass laws that if you mention God, you mention Jesus Christ in those school settings, you will be removed from the school class, from the classroom. When I say a reference to now, because the prophet Isaiah is speaking in the, uh, concerning the days of Ahaz, but he's speaking about the present and also the future. And he's taught, he's giving you a picture, not just about the days of Ahaz, but in the days in which you live. And days that are coming. He, he's talking about leaders that are going to remove the mention of God. Get rid of the mention of God. Get rid of the mention of the Messiah. America's like that. They're trying to get rid of prayer. They, you know, for years try to get rid of prayer out of public schools. Try to get rid of mentioning God, Jesus. So we see the rulers of Sodom. He says, give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. Listen, you should be hearing the Torah, you should be hearing the instruction of God Almighty. You should be hearing the Word of the Lord. And as we go through these chapters, you're going to see that is one of the main reasons why all this woe and calamity came on them, is coming on them, and will come on them. Is because of their rejection of the Word of God Almighty. Their lack of knowledge of the Lord. In His Word. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices? And He begins through verse 11 all the way through verse 15. He talks about their religion. It is so bad. It's basically they're just going through the motions, church. They bring the sacrifices to God and, and that He told them to bring. They, they observe the feast days and the, the new moons. But their worship is just an outward form. They were just going through the motions. Basically, if we could understand it this way, when you read these verses 11 through 15, what you see is people who have just simply become religious. Just going to There's no obedience in their life. They just become religious. He said, it gets so bad, he says, when you lift your hands to me in prayer, he said, I'm going to hide my eyes from you. He said, I'm not even going to hear your prayer. See, what we have to understand is that God doesn't just call us to come to church and call us to pray. You can pray and pray and I can pray. But if our life isn't right, all we're doing is going through the motions. Just a bunch of religious folk. 
there was no reality they claimed to be. And so, and I'll just read verse 15 for the sake of time. And when you spread forth your hands, He said, I'll hide my eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. As I was meditating upon these verses before I came, I had this thought come to my mind. I need to ask you the question, is there ever a time when God will not hear prayer? Is there ever a time that you can go to God and spend time with God in prayer and God says, I'm not even going to hear your prayer? And the answer is yes. If you and I are full of rebellion like these people were and refuse to have a knowledge of God and have apostatized and turned our backs on God, we can go through the motions and we can act like we're doing all right. We can act like we're good. But God says, if you don't have an obedient life, if all you have is external religion, all you are is just going through the motions. Now you said to one of the churches in the book of Revelation, you have a name that you're alive, but you're dead. I know this is a heavy word. I pray to God, I, I, I don't want to be that person. And I know you, I, I pray to God, you don't want to be that person where all you're doing is just going through the motions. You're just religious. You don't really live it. You don't really mean it. God says, I, He said, away with your sacrifices. Just get rid of them. Just don't even bring the sacrifices anymore. But here he is again in verse 16 after he places an indictment upon him and you'll see this throughout the prophet Isaiah after he places this indictment of how far away they've gone away from God after he does that then he says come to me because he's that kind of God. And you'll see it over and over and over as we study the prophets in these chapters. You'll see him. He'll lay down indictment after indictment after indictment. And then he'll say, come to me. He'll lay down another indictment. And then he'll say, come to me. And so he tells them in verse 16, he says, wash you, make you clean, put away the evil out of your doings from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek justice. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. These things he just mentions is the essence of walking with God. And when we're, if we're really walking with God, we're going to be clean. We're going to be pure. We're going to put away evil from our lives. We're going to be people that are just people. We're going to be a righteous people. What's right? Amen. The essence of Christianity. And then verse 18, he says, Come now. Come now. Come to me. Come now and let us reason together. Let's just sit down. You know, this, this is amazing to me, the way God is. I, you see God in Isaiah 6 sitting upon that throne high and lifted up. The King of the universe. With all power and authority. And here he is pleading with humanity. Come into humanity and says, Come now, let us reason together. Let's talk about this. We need to consider some things here. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you be willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured with a sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. And He said, it's your decision. He said, I want you to come and I want to cleanse you. I want to redeem you. Let's talk about it. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. He said, I'll remove all your sin. I'll take it away. If you come to me, I'll redeem you. How's He going to do it? By the blood. 
18 through 20, he's talking about a very, very important festival. It's called the Feast of the Day of Atonement. That's Yom Kippur. He was speaking to the people in that day, but he's making a reference into the future day of the Lord. And we'll get to that in just a minute. We'll see that term day of the Lord or that day mentioned multiple times in the next few chapters. He speaks to them about that day, about his, his willingness that they would come to Him, that He would redeem them. But He's also speaking about a future time. When Messiah returns back to the earth, we call it His second coming. When He returns on the Day of Atonement, literally on the Day of Atonement, the Jews are going to receive their Redeemer, going to receive their Messiah. And when they do, God is going to forgive them of their sins on some future Day of Atonement. Let me just talk to you just a minute about the significance of what God is saying. Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. On the Day of Atonement, you can read the book of Leviticus in the 16th chapter. We taught this to you not long ago. On the Day of Atonement, the holiest day on Israel's calendar. It's when the atonement for the sins of the nation are made before God. priest would take and put two lots in a container and hold it above the head. The priest would reach into that container and pull a lot, both, both the lots out. And, and the first one that comes, the, the lot for the Lord is supposed to fall in the right hand. If it falls in the right hand, then they would say that it was definitely God's will, God was in it. That lot in the right hand would be placed upon the head of a goat called the Lord's goat. That goat was sacrificed on the Day of Atonement for the sins of the people. The other lot was placed on the head of what was called the scapegoat, Azazel. This goat, this goat was not killed they would confess the sins of the people upon the head of that scapegoat after the other goat had been killed and the blood was applied before uh, the veil, the Ark of the Covenant, blood applied seven times. But that live goat, King James translated the scapegoat. They would confess the sins of the nation upon the head of that goat and they would wrap around the head of that goat the horns of that goat, a scarlet cloth. It was so scarlet, the only thing that you can compare the color with was blood. It looked just like blood hanging from the horns of that goat. It was in the shape of a tongue. That's why they called it the red tongue goat. That scarlet cloth on the horn of that goat stayed on the horn of that goat until it was led 12 miles out into the south to no man's land. 12 miles out into the wilderness and along that 12 mile journey there were 10 stations that were set up along the way as that goat was led by the fit man to be brought to one station and and another, a priest would get it and walk it to the next station. Another priest would get it and walk it to the next station until it's 12 miles out into the wilderness. They would take the scarlet cloth off the horn of that goat and they would place it on a rock. Later in history, the Jews added to the observation of this they would push that goat off the cliff. In the book of Leviticus, in the 16th chapter, God didn't tell him to do this. It just says that he was supposed to go into the wilderness and be let go. 
as the sins of the people are being removed from the camp. But Israel took that goat and threw it off the precipice of a cliff. And the rocks would shred the flesh of that animal to pieces as it hit the bottom. And when that scapegoat, that Azazel died, then that crimson cloth that was on the horn, they said it turned solid white. That means the sins of the people had been removed from the camp. And God redeemed them. Their sins were covered for another year. And when that cloth turned solid white, that priest would lift that cloth up like this and, and all the way down the stations, ten stations, they would lift the cloth until finally everybody in Jerusalem could see as the cloth is being lifted there that the sins of the people had been removed and that they were forgiven on the Day of Atonement and the people would begin to dance and would begin to celebrate because they know that God had removed their sins from them. In the future, when Jesus Christ returns, the Jews who for the most part have rejected Him, when they receive Him then, on that Day of Atonement, they're going to be redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And there's going to be a huge celebration. And that type that they practiced is going to be fulfilled. And they're going to recognize that He's their Redeemer. Hallelujah. The last 40 years of their temple, the last 40 years of their temple, the Jews say, that miracle of that cloth that crimson red cloth that looked like blood that turned white the last 40 years of the existence of their temple, that miracle stopped. You know why it stopped? Because that's when Jesus died. He died in the year around 33 A.D. It was 70 A.D. when the temple was destroyed. And that miracle stopped because there was no need for the type anymore. Jesus Christ fulfilled the type. But not only that, when that miracle stopped, the Jews knew that the destruction of the temple was about to happen. And so God gives you a picture here in this this story, he says, you come to me right now. He said, I'll redeem you like the scapegoat. Your sins might be red like blood, but I'll make them white as snow. If you'll just repent and you'll just get right. Hallelujah. He just said, come to me, come to me, come to me. And in the future, a future time, when Jesus Christ comes on the Day of Atonement, it's going to announce the redemption for those who believe and the judgment upon those who do not believe. Forty years before that temple was destroyed, around 70 A.D., forty years before that miracle stopped, it let the Jews know destruction's come. Amen. If you look at the Word of God, you'll see when that's going to happen. Ezekiel 38 and 39, in the day of the Lord, the latter days, when Russia invades into the Middle East, instead of it being old Assyria, Russia's going to invade into the Middle East. And then the Lord will return and He will defeat the armies of Russia on the mountains of Israel. And when they see Him coming and delivering them from Russia, that end time enemy, the Bible says that's when they're going to believe when they look upon Him, when they behold the Messiah. And then verse 21, after He pleads with them to come, He brings more charges. How is the faithful city become a harlot? So now they're not just likened unto a child in rebellion against their father. 
But now God uses another analogy. He said, there were my wife. He said, but my wife became a harlot. She's broken that relationship. She's broken the covenant. How is the faithful city? She's no longer faithful anymore. She used to be faithful, but she's not faithful anymore. She's a harlot. And you have to understand, these are metaphors, these are pictures. It's not talking about a woman in Israel, it's talking about the whole nation. Male and female. People who are no longer faithful to God. It's full of judgment and righteousness lodged, righteousness lodged in it but now murderers. What God said to that nation, He said there was a time when it was faithful and it was righteous. Righteousness lodged in it. He said, but it's now full of a bunch of murderers. Do you realize today that in, in some ways, secular Israel, that that charge of murder can be placed upon secular Israel? It for sure can be placed on the United States of America. A nation full of murderers. God says judgment's coming. That, it applies to any nation. Verse 22 again, he continues to lay down more charges. He said, thy silver has become dross. Thy, thy wine is mixed with water. He said, you reprobate silver. You're not pure silver anymore. You reprobate silver. You become dross. There's mixture in you. He said the wine, he says, you're like wine that's been watered down. You're not, the purity's gone. It's not what it used to be. Verse 23, thy princes are rebellious. The leaders are rebellious. Companions of thieves, everyone loveth gifts, followeth after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither doth the cause of the widow come unto them. They're just after bribes. You can pay them off. Verse 24, Therefore saith the Lord, the Lord of hosts. There it is again. Yahweh, Sabiot, Tisbaot, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies. The mighty one of Israel. His powers being referred to here. Ah, oh, I will ease me of my adversaries and avenge me of my enemies. I want you to think about that when God gets ready to be rid of His enemies. The mighty one of Israel. The Lord of armies. When He gets ready to be rid of His enemies. Think about that. Verse 24, I'll turn my hand upon thee, purely purge away thy dross, and take away all thy tin. I will restore thy judges as at the first, and thy counselors as at the beginning. Afterward thou shalt be called the city of righteousness. The faithful was it. He said it's not going to stay unfaithful. He said there's coming a day when they will return to their faithfulness. Now, in the ultimate, we're talking about in the future, when the Lord comes back in the day of the Lord and sets up the kingdom. Okay? And He said, I'm going to restore the judges then. I'm going to restore proper leadership then. Amen. It's all, in, in case you don't know it, it's also a reference to the church right now. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Someday she'll be faithful again. Zion shall be redeemed with judgment and her converts with righteousness. He said there's going to be some that turn to God. They're going to turn back to God. Zion, Zion, say Zion. That's a reference to Jerusalem. It's a reference to the city of Jerusalem in the future. 
a literal sign is going to return in faithfulness. But it also speaks, so you'll understand, these are spiritual truths as well that speak about the church. It's, it, speaks, it speaks about the presence. When you talk about Zion, you're talking about the presence of God. He's saying there's coming a time when this city is going to be faithful and they're going to be dwelling in the presence of God once again. And there's going to be joy like the Psalms talk about. Zion is not just a physical place. Zion is something that happens in the Spirit. And he says when these people return back to their faithfulness, having played the harlot, having been unrighteous and unfaithful, when they turn back to God, you're going to hear singing again. They're going to be in the presence of God again. Hallelujah. Give the Lord praise in this house. Zion speaks of the kingdom of God. It speaks of moving in the Spirit of God. It has two fulfillments. A literal fulfillment and a spiritual fulfillment. Right now I'm in Zion. Right now you're in Zion. In fact, you are the city of God. You are the new Jerusalem of God right now where the presence of God is, where you worship and you have joy and you celebrate. If you don't believe me, read the Psalms. When David set up his little tabernacle and the Ark of the Covenant was put in that little, little tabernacle on Mount Zion, they worshiped God 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They never, never stopped praising Him. They were in the presence of God continually. Both Jews and Gentiles worshiping God there on Mount Zion. It was just a picture of the church and the worship that we have now and in the future when He comes back spiritual and the literal will come together and become one. The presence of God is, is promised here to the converts. Say to the converts. To those who have turned back to God with righteousness. The presence of God is promised. In verse 28, you see there's two sides. And then he says, and the destruction of the transgressors and of the sinners shall be together. And they that forsake the Lord shall be consumed. He said, you got the, those that convert and they're the ones, they're going to be celebrating the presence of God as they turn back to God. But he said, those that don't, he said, judgment's coming upon them. Who's he talking to? He's not talking about people here that's in the world. He's speaking to Judah and Jerusalem. He's talking about to his covenant sons. He's talking about, he's talking to those, if you can understand it, that are in the church, but they have gone away from God. Don't say that you can go away from God and not be judged. The transgressors, those who have broken the law of God. Verse 29, For they shall be ashamed of the oaks which they have desired, and ye, sh and ye shall be confounded for the gardens that you have chosen. What's he saying? Those gardens and those oaks that you set your idols up. They would go into these mountains, these hills, and these high places, and they would set up shrines to their false gods, and they would bow down, bow down and worship them. And God says, there's coming a time for all those shrines you've set up, all of your idolatry. He said, you're going to be ashamed of that. You study church history, see, the, there's multifaceted fulfillment here. There's one meaning, but many fulfillments. If you study church history, the church as a whole in the third century went into idolatry. And it's still in the world today. It's called the mother of harlots. And she's riding on the back of a scarlet colored beast in the book of Revelation. That mother of harlots is a false church system that has abandoned God. The idolatry. He said there's going to be a, a day when you will be ashamed of the shrines you set up, the idolatries you set up under those terebinth trees, those oak trees. You might not see too much of that in America except you go into some so-called house of worship and they've got idols all over the walls. 
That's what he's talking about. But you go over there to like Taiwan. I've been to Taiwan, as you know, many times. You go over there. They've got shrines on hills everywhere. Idols set up in those little houses. And they go up in those hills and they worship false gods. Verse 30, For you shall be as an oak whose leaf fadeth, and as a garden that hath no water. You're going to just be dried up. You're just going to dry up. And the strong shall be as tau, and the maker of it as a spark. And they shall birth burn together, none shall quench them. So we see the sad condition to which Israel went. We see today, spiritually speaking, the sad condition of where much of the church has gone, we see a picture of the future, the apostasy that will be in the land before the coming of the Lord. But then in chapter 2, the Lord says it's not always going to be this way. Something's going to change. Who? In verse 1, the word that Isaiah the son of Amos saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the last days. First time that that's mentioned. The last days. First of all, we need to determine when is this going to happen that I'm about to preach to you. The last days. God says the last days. The last days in the Bible depends on where you are in the Bible. When Isaiah said the last days here, let's go to the book of Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1. I'm going to get uh, Brother Jonathan to read this for me. There's a last days that has to do with the last days of the old covenant when a new covenant would be brought in. And that has to do with after Jesus comes and His death, burial, and resurrection, an ascension takes place and He pours out His Spirit upon humanity and we become temples of the Lord. In Acts chapter 2, the Bible says the outpouring of the Holy Ghost was a fulfillment of the prophet's that said in the last days what God would pour out His Spirit upon all flesh. The last day started when the Holy Ghost was poured out on the day of Pentecost. You're in the last days. Hebrews 1 also makes it clear. When do the last days begin? Read. Ah, you see that? Amen. Do you see that? God is sundry times in divers manners, spake in times past through the prophets. But hath in these last days spoken to us by Son. So now we know when the last days began. The last days began when Jesus Christ came into this world crucified, dead, buried, risen from the dead, ascended to sit on the right hand of God. You're in the last days right now. And so the Bible says, this vision, he says, Isaiah saw in the last days. He's talking about right now. Depends on where you are in the Bible. The last days then is a reference to the end of the old covenant and the beginning of the new covenant. We're in those last days now. Acts chapter 2. You could read that. The outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to read it now. But but then there's a last days that you might call last days for the world. The world's not going to come to an end. But a last days that has to do with the coming of Jesus Christ, the coming of the Messiah, and the setting up of His kingdom. That's a future last days. 
So you have to understand the Word of God and the prophets. There's one meaning, but there's many fulfillments. You're in Isaiah 2 now, spiritually. But in its ultimate fulfillment, we're not there yet. That's when Jesus comes back and sets up the kingdom. Let me go to Micah. Let's look at Micah 4. A contemporary to Isaiah. Brother, just read it. I don't want to turn there. Read it. Micah 4, verses 1 through 5. Listen to what he reads. But okay, but in the last days it shall come to pass. Read. Amen. You're going to think when I read Isaiah 2, you think I'm reading the same thing that he just read. The last days. You'll hear that term last days and then we'll read the term latter years. That means last days is when Jesus comes back and sets up His kingdom. Latter years simply means the coming of the Messiah, the coming of the Lord. Latter years. That's the time frame. So it depends on where you are in the Bible. But God said, in the last days, something's going to change. He said, I'm going to have a temple. I'm going to have a city. And there's going to be some people in that city that are faithful. There's going to be some people in that city that are going to be the right kind of people. He said, something's going to change. And it's going to happen in the last days. So the first time it's mentioned, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. Mountains speak of the kingdom. The Lord's house will be in that mountain. Speaks of worship. There He is. He's in Mount Zion. In the last days, of course, again, when He comes back, and that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established. The mountain. The top of the mountain shall be exalted above hills and all nations shall flow unto it. That means all of these gods that they placed in these little hills and these little mountains. He said the true God, all these people worshiping all these false gods. He said there's coming a time when nobody's going to be worshiping all these false gods in hills. They're going to, they're going to worship the one true God, the only true God that there is. And His name is Jesus Christ. His house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills and all nations shall flow into it. So you'll understand. Let me bring you spiritual application. Right now, you're in, in chapter 2 because the Bible says in John chapter 2, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up. And then John chapter 4, we have a woman at the well that asked Jesus, where do we worship? Do we worship in Samaria, that temple in Samaria, or do we worship in Jerusalem? Which temple do we worship at? And Jesus said, there's coming a time when you'll neither worship there or in Jerusalem. They that worship me will worship me in spirit and in truth. So what you see here now is you're in Isaiah chapter 2 in the Spirit of Zion and you are worshiping God. You are praising Him. You're exalting Him. Now notice something interesting. Now that's now in the Spirit. But in the future, it has a future fulfillment. When the Messiah comes back and sets up His kingdom, His house is going to be in the top of the mountains. And the Bible says the nations shall flow and notice it says all nations. Question for you. Are all nations flowing to Him now? No. That means an ultimate fulfillment is still in the future. But there's going to come a time when all nations, not just Jerusalem, 
not just Israel, but all nations, the Goyim, the Gentiles are going to worship him. All nations will flow when he comes back and sets up his kingdom. And now notice this. They're flowing, but they're flowing upward. Contrary to nature. I remember when we were in Rio also, I was looking at a stream that was flowing I couldn't figure it out. It almost looked to me by my eyesight that it was flowing uphill. I asked somebody, I said, is that flowing uphill? I said, I don't think that's possible that that can flow uphill because that's contrary to nature. It might look like it is. But the Bible says that the nations are going to stream into Zion which speaks of His continual presence. And they will worship Him there with abundant joy and dancing and celebration. And you will be as people who stream contrary to nature. You'll flow upward. Which means contrary to your fallen nature. If I can bring it to you so you'll understand it right now. Is that you used to live a certain way. You used to have a certain attitude. Amen. And God talked about the attitude in Isaiah chapter 1 of those worshipers. Their attitude was wrong. And that's why God says away with all of it. Because your attitude is wrong. But He said there's coming a time when people who are going to be in this place of worship, in this city, He said they're going to go, they're going to flow contrary to nature and they're going to flow uphill. That means that they used to be haters. They're going to become lovers. Those that used to be sinners will become believers. Hallelujah. Give God praise in this house. You're looking at Apostle Paul. Paul persecuted the church without mercy, but he flowed backwards up into Mount Zion. And when he experienced the presence of the Lord, he became a preacher instead of a murderer of the church. Hallelujah. You give, give God praise in this house. You look at Peter. Peter denied the Lord three times. But when he got the Holy Ghost, something changed in him. He's the one that stood up on the day of Pentecost and preached on the day of Pentecost, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I'm just telling you, I'm preaching to some people today. You once were addicts, but you're no longer addicts to that kind of stuff. You're addicted to Jesus. Something has changed in you. You are It's contrary to nature. People who used to know you before you came into Zion, the presence of God in the Holy Ghost with resurrection life. People who used to know you, if they saw you now, they would say, you're not the same person anymore. That's right. I'm flowing upward, contrary to nature. God has changed me from what I used to be. And so now we experience that in the Spirit right now. But the last days is also again a reference to the time when Jesus comes back and sets up His kingdom in the earth. And all nations shall flow into that mountain and worship Him. Now watch this. Now look at verse 3. And many people shall go and say, Come you and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways. See, something's changed. People who didn't want to go to church. People who didn't want to hear the Word of God. People who were not interested in any of that at all. People who one time were bored with hearing the Word of God. Bored with the Word of God. The Bible says something has changed in them. They said, let us go up in the mountain of the Lord that He may teach us His ways. We want to know His Word. We want to know the truth Amen. something's going to change hallelujah and I believe you wouldn't be here tonight if you didn't want to be I pray that's the truth but how many of y'all remember the days when you didn't really you didn't want to go to church to you church was boring it was a waste of time you got better things to do oh when's the pastor going to get done preaching I hope he don't go too long hallelujah there's coming a time when something's going to change in people and they're going to want to be taught. Now, now, now the good news is this. You won't have to go and listen to a preacher. You'll get to listen to God Himself in the flesh. Jesus Christ Himself is going to teach you His Word. Hallelujah. 
I'm looking forward to that church service. I can't, can you imagine hearing him preach? Nobody can preach like Jesus. <laughs> Even religious leaders in it, they said, never a man spake like this man. <laughs> I can't wait to that day. I'm looking forward to it. Now, as a preacher, I'm looking forward to it because I'm going to see an attitude change in people who go to church. They're going to want to stay late. That's the kind of people that are going to be in the city of God. People who have been changed by the power of God. And we will walk in His paths. For out of Zion, Zion, shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. People who don't want the law, they don't want the instruction of God. That law is going to be there. This lawless age that we live in is going to change. And God is going to be governing His kingdom by the, His law, by His word. Give God praise. Instead of all that chaos and all that confusion that we saw in the first chapter, something's going to change. Order is going to be set back in the land. God's order is going to be set back in the land. Give the Lord a hand clap of praise. So this is the first time last days is mentioned. And we'll see it, um, I believe, in the in, and I'm going to go all the way up to the sixth chapter quickly, but I'm going to tell you, we'll see it at least nine times. The term, the day of the Lord, or that day, okay? That term, the day, that day, the day of the Lord is the same thing, all right? Y'all with me? So it speaks of our present spiritual reality because we're in the kingdom spiritually. But it speaks of the second coming of Jesus and His setting up the literal kingdom upon the earth. Okay? The sign is the presence of God. Unending presence of God. He shall judge, verse 4, among the nations. He's going to set order. He's going to judge. The Lord's going to make everything right. He's going to... God, God, let me put it this way. God's going to make it work out. Amen. See, right now, if there's a dispute, what do people do? They want to fight. I mean, look at the, look at the conventions. The Republican convention and now the Democratic convention. All it is is a bunch of fussing and fighting. and You know, they, I think if you put a sword in their hand, they'd kill each other. You know what I'm saying? But there's going to come a time when people are not going to fight it out. God's going to work it out. God's going to judge. He's going to settle disputes among people. He shall judge among the nations and shall rebuke many people. And they shall beat their swords and the plowshares, their spears and the pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war anymore. Peace, universal peace, when the Prince of Peace returns. And only when the Prince of Peace returns is there going to be uni universal peace in the earth. And He's going to make sure that all disputes are settled. Hallelujah. No more fighting it out, working it out. Hallelujah. I'm looking forward to that time. And in verse 5 again, He makes this plea. Come. Amen. O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Amen. So I look at you and say, hey, come. Let us go walk in the light of the Amen. Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, what an awesome. Can you imagine? I mean, it's, it's, it's fun coming to church. Amen. I will tell you, I was really excited about preaching the Word of God tonight. It, it's, it's really fun to come to church. But can you imagine in that day when there's going to be no more fussing and fighting? No more disputes? Man, you just get... Go, Get go up there and hear Jesus preach Himself the Word, and He'll settle all disputes. Hallelujah! I'm looking forward to that time. Living in the continual, unending presence of God with worship and praise and jubilation and joy, it'll never end. Hallelujah. 
But he says, remember, he said, there's a certain kind of people that are going to be in that city. So, yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> so after making that plea again, once again, to come, to be a part of his kingdom, indictments once again. Therefore thou hast forsaken thy people, the house of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east. They are soothsayers like the Philistines, and they please themselves in the children of strangers. God said, so you know, he said, there's a certain kind of people that's going to be in that city. So the indictment comes down. He said, there's, there's some people, they're soothsayers, like the Philistines. And they take pleasure. They please themselves in the children of strangers. What does that mean? Well, in, in one sense, let me put it to you this way. It speaks of polygamy. They please themselves here in the children of strangers. Polygamous relationships. It's talking about people in the church who are marrying unbelievers. They please themselves. in the children of strangers. He said they're like the world. They live like the world. They're not different from the world. They, they please themselves in strangers and they do the same thing that the world does. He said they're soothsayers like the Philistines. So there's no difference between my people the way they live and the people that are in the world, so you'll understand it. He continues the charge in verse 7, Their land also is full of silver and gold. Neither is there any end of their treasure. Their land is also full of horses. Neither is there any end of their chariots. See, right before that destruction came in the days of Uzziah, it was a prosperous nation. They had a powerful, powerful army. King Uzziah speaks of the time right before the tribulation period. Jotham, his son that follows him in rulership, speaks of the first year of the tribulation period. Ahaz speaks of the second year of the tribulation period. Are y'all here with me? Hezekiah speaks of the third year of the tribulation period. Manasseh, his son, speaks of the fourth year of the tribulation period. And we'll go through it and I'll, I'll get into more detail of that in just a moment. But in the days of Uzziah, Uzziah they, there was prosperity in, in the nation. They had a powerful, powerful army. It's like it is today in Israel. It's like it, let me tell you, if you think it's just going to all fall, you know, anyway, to pieces. I had another thought, but I'm in church. If you think it's going to all fall to pieces, you know, uh, at the beginning of the tribulation period, that's, that's where you're wrong. There's going to be prosperity and power like you've never seen. God talks about the, the economic, economic evil. So there's prosperity everywhere. Do you see this? They're full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. The land is full of horses. Neither is there any end to their chariots. That speaks of a powerful army. Their land is full of chariots. I don't know if you know this tonight, but the chariot, the Merkabah, the Hebrew Merkabah, that's what Israel calls their tanks today. They call them chariots. And he said there's no end of their chariots. They are a powerful army. You know Israel today has a powerful army. Israel today is a, is a, is a wealthy nation. Amen. Amen. These things are things he said you can see right before the kingdom is set up. He said you can see these things in the world. 
The evil in economy, the evil in, in worship. Verse 8, the land is also full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands, that which their own fingers have made. He talks about people bowing down, the mean man, the great man. Bowing down, God says, forgive them not. The evil of idolatry, the evil of economy, the evil of military power. Right before the kingdom is set up. Here he is again. After another indictment, here he goes in verse 10. Come to me. Come to me. Come to Messiah. Come to the rock. The rock is Messiah. Come to the rock. Once again, the plea is made. Look at it, verse 10. Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. The lofty looks of man shall be humbled. The haughtiness of men shall be bowed down. The Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Second time it's used. It's the same thing as the day of the Lord. Read the next verse. It'll tell you that. For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon every. You see that? That day is the same thing as the day of the Lord. So now we have a reference to it again. That day is the last days. It's speaking of the day of the Lord. The coming of the Lord. The time when He sets up His kingdom. See, Isaiah it was about Ahab and his day. But it's pointing also to the future. Pride is going to be brought down. Verse 12, For the day of the Lord of hosts shall be upon everyone that is proud, the lofty upon everyone that is lifted up. He shall be brought low, and upon the cedars of Lebanon that are high and lifted up, and upon all the oaks of Bashan, and upon the high mountains, upon all the hills that are lifted up, upon every high tower, and upon every fence wall. The towers come down. You see them? Towers coming down. Towers. Symbols of pride and arrogance. I said it. 9-11, when 9-11 happened, I said it in the church. We were over there on Brazos. I said it was a judgment from God. And preachers all over America said, that wasn't a judgment from God, that was the devil. No, it was a judgment. In fact, the Holy Ghost spoke through us, to us, through us, and let us know before those towers came down, they were going to come down. God said the towers would come down and they came down. It was a judgment from God Almighty. Hallelujah. The pride and the arrogance. I don't believe that. Well, that's fine. But if you don't think God is in charge of everything, then you need to wake up. He allows the devil to do some things, but he's still in control. Upon every high tower and upon every fence wall, and upon the ships of Tarshish, upon the pleasant pictures, and the loftiness of man shall be bowed down, and the haughtiness of men shall be made low, and the Lord alone shall be exalted in that day. Fourth time it's used. In that day. All these people who are transgressors, all these traitors from any nation, anybody that betrays the Lord, all these people who commit treason. God said they're all coming down. But He said... He's going to be exalted. All people who walk around in pride and arrogance, they're all going to be humbled. Hallelujah. I want to humble myself. I don't want God to have to humble me. I want God, I want to humble myself. That's why I want to get on my knees and repent before my God. I don't want Him to have to humble me. The Bible tells us that day is coming. The Lord alone shall be exalted. In that day, Amen. and the idols shall be utterly abolished. That's right. Everything that's against the Lord is going to be removed. Amen. Amen. They shall go in the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord, for the glory of His majesty, and when He arises to shake terribly the earth. In that day, fifth time. A man shall cast his idols of silver and his idols of gold, which they made each one for himself to worship to the moles and to the bats. See, someday, someday that which we think is so precious, the gold and the silver, we throw it in the street. We throw it in the street. 
That can't be your security. Only God can be your security. <laughs> Fifth time it's used in that day. Verse 20. To go in the clefts of the rocks and the tops of the ragged rocks for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty when He ariseth to shake terribly the earth. Amen. Parallel to this is Revelation chapter 6. We see the heavens depart as a scroll. People hiding in the rocks and the dens of the caves and they're saying, Hide us from the face of Him that sits upon the throne. Hide us from the face of the Lamb for the, for the great day of His wrath is come. And who, who shall be able to stand? The day of the Lord is when God comes back and He first judges and shakes the earth and the earth shakes ter terribly and He brings His wrath upon the earth. That's the day of the Lord. After He does that, then He'll set up His earthly kingdom. And the righteous will enter into this kingdom. But before that, in that day, the day of the Lord, He's going to shake the earth terribly. I'm, I don't know about you, but I'm glad I'm in the church today. I wouldn't want to be in the world tonight. I would not. And I would not want to be backslid tonight. I would not want to be lukewarm tonight. I would not want to be in that position. I tell you, if you've ever been on fire for God, if you have ever humbled yourself before the Lord, now is the time to make sure that your walk is what it's supposed to be. It is now time for me to make sure that my walk is what it's supposed to be. I do not want to find myself backslidden, lukewarm, and carnal like these people were. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Because all the money in the world is not going to protect you. All my weaponry and all your weaponry will not protect you in that day. Only Jesus Christ can protect you. But here's the good news. He has made a promise to those who are believers in Him. The remnant, He has made a promise to protect you in that day. Amen. Hallelujah. You don't have to worry. Well, what am I going to do when all that happens? God said, I'll take care of you. You don't have to worry about anything. Don't sit around. Don't don't have nightmares at night. Don't dream and worry about it all the time. Because God is in the midst of you. He'll be a wall of fire around about you. He will protect His people. He knows how to protect you. It's only those that are outside who have made choices to apostatize, to abandon Him that will experience His wrath. So once again, he makes reference to that day. In verse 22, he says, Cease you from men whose breath is in his nostrils, for wherein is he to be accounted of? They said, Some of you put so much attention upon human beings. <laughs> They're just human beings. And start breathing. Every, any one of you tonight, including myself, can stop breathing right now. Yes, sir. You'll be dead. <laughs> No, God is eternal. I said God is eternal. We need to stop worrying about so much about what other people think. We need to be more concerned about what He thinks. Stop putting your confidence in men. Put your confidence in Jesus Christ. Verse 10, again, Enter into the rock and hide thee in the dust for fear of the Lord and for the glory of His majesty. If you want to be protected, get to the rock. That ultimately is talking about Messiah. And also, I believe in the latter days, it's talking about Petra for Israel. The rock, they will flee to that rock hewn city called Petra, Selah, or Selah, and be protected for the last three and a half years of the tribulation period. I believe he's making a reference as far as the future is concerned. Number one ultimate picture is getting in Jesus, the Messiah, the rock. Or fleeing to Petra. Amen. Amen. Feel the Holy Ghost. Amen. And then chapter 3. Judgment again. For behold the Lord, the Lord of hosts, 
They'll take away from Jerusalem and from Judah the stay of staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water. God said there's coming a time that judgment, when judgment comes, He said, I'm going to take wholeness away. I'm going to take wholeness away. I'm going to take away your support. The whole stay of bread and the whole stay of water. I want you to notice something. He didn't say He's going to take bread away. He didn't say He's going to take water away. He said He's going to take the whole. He's speaking of wholeness. See, God has called us to go on unto perfection. I, if God permit, this will we do. And I said that to you Sunday night. God wants us to walk in wholeness. But these people didn't want it. So God says, I'm going to take wholeness away from you. I'm going to take support away from you. The whole stay of bread, the whole stay of water. I'm going to move quickly now. Not only is He going to take support away, but He's going to take, or excuse me, supply away. I should term it supply, not support. He's going to take supply away, and He's also going to take away support. That means leadership. God shows us in this chapter in, in Isaiah in that day, which is the days we're moving into. He said there's coming a day when leaders, there will be... Uh, people are just not going to want to lead. The apostasy is going to be so great that qualified leaders are not going to want to lead anymore because of the greatness of the apostasy. So not only is He going to take away supply, He's going to take away support. He said the mighty man, the man of war, the judge, the prophet, and the prudent, and the ancient, the captain of fifty, the honorable man, and the counselor, and the cunning artificer, and the eloquent orator. He said there's coming a day that He's going to take away qualified leaders, skilled leaders in various facets, military leaders, on and on it goes, prophets, honorable men. He said, I'm going to remove all of that. And then he says this, and children shall rule over them. Let me just say this to you, my good church. Babies beget babies. If qualified men is removed and babies take their place, all they can produce is more babies. Do you understand what I'm saying? There's coming a time, the Bible says, and children shall rule over them. They're not a proper age. Children shall be their princes and babes shall rule over them. People shall be oppressed, every one by another, every one by his neighbor. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base, against the honorable. Respect will be gone. There will be no respect in the last days in that day. Men who should be respected will not be respected. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient and the base against the honorable. Can you imagine that? Please don't take this wrong. I'm talking about low life people. The base behaving themselves as the Scripture says here. The base against the honor. Respect will be gone. One of the signs of the last days that the Bible says children. There will be a spirit of disobedience that gets a hold of the children. A spirit of rebellion will get a hold of the children. Children will rebel against their parents. Amen. And I'm not... Y'all are good kids. I thank God for the church kids that we have. But, but you don't want to get caught up in an end time picture here of disrespect to ancients, to leaders. You know, qualified men. 
But I thank God. I won't say the name for the sake of... I don't want to embarrass him. But a young man came to my office today before church and he said, you know, I remember what Sister Lori preached about boundaries. She preached that in the youth service about boundaries. And I remember talking to her and she had preached about boundaries of parents, how it's important for parents to set boundaries in your life or a pastor to set boundaries in your life. Amen. And uh, so I was aware of the service. This young man came up to me and he just he said, can I talk to you, Pastor? And I said, yeah, and I'm, here I am, I'm waiting, you know. You know how it is. Okay, what did you do? <laughs> oh, God. Lord Jesus, help me. And uh, he looks at me and he said, Pastor, he said, I just want to tell you thank you for setting boundaries in my life. I told him, I said, you're the manifestation. You know, I, I said, uh, you know, I, I appreciate you. I said, you appreciate me, but I appreciate you because you're the fruit. Amen. And I can tell you honestly, and this, you know how I am, I'm going to be honest with you. But something changed the atmosphere of this church. It was different when I came in here tonight. Amen. I started to feel like, yeah, this is the way it's supposed to be. You know what I'm saying? Hallelujah. And, and I know in the prayer room, and as, as I was thinking about things, I said, I know somebody's been praying and fasting. I know that for sure, but maybe there's some that I don't even know been praying and fasting. I want to tell you something. God heard your prayer. God heard your fasting. Because there's something that has changed in the attitude of this church. Hallelujah to the Lamb. But a judgment from God, God comes and takes supply away and support away. That's a picture of the last days. But I thank God for a young man like that. He didn't have to take the time. He could have kept it to himself. But he went in there. The opposite of what I just read. There was respect. Amen. Hallelujah! Amen. In that day, oh, six times it's mentioned. In that day, shall he swear, saying, I will not be a healer, for in my house is neither bread nor clothing. Make me not a ruler of the people, for Jerusalem is ruined and Judah is fallen, because their tongue and their doings are against the Lord to provoke the eyes of his glory. So we've got these leaders saying, I don't want to rule no more. I, I just don't want that responsibility anymore. Okay, So that's what's going to be in the last day. Qualified leaders are going to be taken away and babes are going to rule over them. Qualified men will not want to serve anymore. I'm, let me say this, Brother Stewart. I admire you. So I just say to the church, would you please pray for Brother Stewart but not just Brother Stewart, but for the whole Odessa Police Department, will you cover these men in prayer? Because we are living in a time, and as it is said right here, there will come a time when the man of war, the judge, the prophet, the prudent, the ancient, the captain of 50, the honorable man, the counselor, the cunning officer, the eloquent oracle, they're not going to want to serve anymore. These public servants are not going to want to serve anymore because of the condition of the last days. We need to thank God for men like that are still put on... You know, I'm not running for office, but I know what's right. Not long ago, I had to go to jury duty. I thank God they didn't pick me. But it was about a man who shot at a police officer. I thought he just pulled the gun on the police officer. He had his shot. Him and his friend actually shot at a police officer. And uh, so they questioned the panel. I mean, there was over 100 people there. They questioned the panel. I was one of them. And I lifted my hand because they wanted to know where we were. I said, I absolutely do not, do not agree with anybody ever pulling a gun out on a police officer. Amen. That's what I said. And so, you know, I wasn't the only one, but he went through the, the panel. And then afterwards, they kept about 25 of us there. And we went to the judge's desk. And both attorneys asked us questions about that. 
And they said, well, if it's a police officer giving testimony, will you automatically side with them? Um, I said, no, I'm going to base the decision on the whole trial, not just the testimony of one. And uh, then the prosecuting attorney asked me a question. But then the judge asked me, he says, what if it's a bad cop? Are you going to st stand on the side of the bad cop? I said, of course not. But they didn't pick me. <laughs> they didn't pick me. Come to find out, Brother Michael Stewart, and I told you about that trial, come to find out, that man got life in prison. But my point is this, we need to pray for the leaders of our, our local leaders. We need to pray for the police department. I was in the prayer room tonight praying for the leaders of this church. In every facet, worship leaders, choir director, Sunday school teachers, everybody, because we need skilled people in this last days to instruct the people of God. And it can get so bad, nobody's want to do it anymore. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Come on, I hear the Holy Ghost right now. Some of you young people need to walk up to your youth leaders and just tell them, I really do appreciate all the work that you do for us. Thank you for helping us. Thank you for caring enough to keep doing this. I know it's not easy at times. Some of y'all need to tell those teachers how much you appreciate them. Hallelujah. It means a lot. Because in the last days, there's just going to be some people just not going to want to do it anymore. I don't want to be a healer, he said. Hallelujah. Let me finish the third chapter very quickly. Again, he shows us two sides. The show of their countenance doth witness against them. The show of their countenance, the way they look in their face, their attitudes, doth witness against them. Against them. They declare their sin and sought them. They hide it not. Woe unto their soul, for they have rewarded evil unto themselves that's the wicked there's two sides but say ye to the righteous that it shall be well with him for they shall eat the fruit of their doings hallelujah it's not going to be well for the transgressor but it's going to be well for those that do what's right say praise the Lord church <clears throat> hallelujah okay verse 11 warn of the wicked it shall be ill with him for the reward of his hand shall be given him for as my people children are their oppressors and women rule over them. O my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the ways of thy paths. There's going to come, come a time children are going to rule over them. That women are going to rule. Amen. Amen. I thank God for women. But when the women start trying to take over the role of authority, we got one running for office right now. And I pray when I say this, I'm not saying it inappropriately. My God, help us. I'm going to say it again. My God, help us. And if you plan on voting for that person, you, God have mercy on your soul if I find that out. I'm not supporting any particular candidate, but you better not oh, have mercy. <laughs> Women rule over them. Children of their oppressors. They cause the air to destroy the ways of that past. See, they're not telling people the Word of God. They're not teaching them the Word of God anymore. See, they, they have forsaken the Holy One of Israel. They're departing from holiness. It's not important anymore. They're causing them to depart from the right ways. I want it, let me just say this to you. Holiness is a lot easier than unholiness. For anybody out there who thinks, I want to live, you know, I don't want to live holy. I tell you tonight, unholiness is a lot harder than holiness ever was. Somebody said amen. Brother Jared came to me Sunday. He said, I got some people I'm working with. They've come to this church a few times and they have a problem with holiness. I said, well, they're just some people we can't help, brother. Because we're not changing the message. And if they want to be a part of here, they're going to have to come in here and they're going to have to do it God's way. But I'm not going to, you know, I'm not going to get in this plea bargaining thing. 
Well, I'll come to church, you know. No, man, we're going to stand for the Word of God. We're going to preach the Word of God. And, and, and you, you, you might be one of those people that, that we just not can't help you. Just not, boy, that's a, what a talk. Just not can't help you. Didn't sound like a qualified leader, did I? No, and I, I told that brother that. I said, you go tell him. Maybe we, we just probably can't help you. You ought to make an excuses. If you tell me, well, I don't understand it, then I'll help you understand it. But if you're already making excuses as to why you don't want to come to church because you're having a problem with holiness, this is not where you want to be. I can't help you. And I'm not, I'm not called to help everybody. I'm called to help you. So if I can't help you, just tell him I can't help you. I'll go find somebody I can. Okay, here we go. Now, verse 14, The Lord will enter into judgment with the ancients of His people, the princes thereof, for they have eaten up the vineyard and spoiled the poor in their house. I mean, the leadership is not what it's supposed to be. What mean you that you beat my people to pieces and grind their faces, grind the face of the poor, saith the Lord God of hosts. They're just unjust. It's just unjust situations, right? And then as he closes this third chapter out, he gets into the pride of women in the last days. Woo! Hallelujah. Man, I couldn't wait to get to this part. Because us men don't have no problem. I'm just kidding. Now, by the time we get to the end of the third chapter, he's talking about the men being, you know, judged too. But anyway, remember, we're talking about what kind of people is going to be in that city that he saw in Isaiah chapter 2. Well, for sure, these women are not going to be in there. The women he began to describe are women that are full of pride. Women that are full of vanity. They're so vain when you study the, the wording behind the words. In, in, they're plain enough as it is in English. But when you get down to it, he's going to talk about women walking wantonly. You know what that means? He's, they, they've got their head stuck up in the air. And they're kind of looking over to the side like this. To see if, if anybody's looking at them. Are you watching me? Do you like what you see? No, I'm, I'm not kidding you. I, I'm not kidding you. That's, that's what he's talking about. You know there's women out there, hallelujah, in the world, man. Okay, maybe some in the church. Alright, and, and so then he talks about all of these accessories that they put on. Okay? To try to be attractive. You don't want me to preach this, do you? <laughs> Moreover, the Lord saith, because the daughter of Zion are haughty and walk with stretched forth necks and wanton eyes. That's what it means. They walk, they got their head stretched forth, they're a little, you know, got their head tilted just a little bit. That's what it means, tilted just a little bit. Are you looking at me? Because I want you to. <laughs> Walking and menacing as they go. And making a tinkling with their feet. <laughs> okay, so anyway. I mean, they got chains on their, their ankles. I mean, they got accessories all over their bodies because they're trying to dress themselves up so they can be attractive, you know. Look at your neighbor and say, they're just so vain. There used to be a song that was sung, You're So Vain. You notice I changed the word. I didn't tell you to tell your neighbor, You're so vain. I said, Tell your neighbor, they are so vain. Somebody said, God don't care about... Yeah, He does. 
Therefore the Lord shall smite with a scab the crown of the head, the daughters of Zion. The Lord will discover their secret parts in that day. Ah. Another time that day. Wow. So in that, at that point, now we're at the seventh one, aren't we? In that day. You got a pen? I got to mark this. Anybody got a pen? You got a pen? You got to mark this. Okay. So that's number seven, right? Because I'm trying to count these. In that day. Wow. All right. So I got to change that. Okay. Thanks. Are y'all ready? In that day. That end time. The Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling or- ornaments about their feet, their calls, their round tires like the moon, the chains, the bracelets, the muffers, the bonnets, the ornaments of the legs, the headbands, the tablets, the earrings, the rings, the nose jewel, the changeable suits of a parable, and the mantles, and the wimples, and the crisping pins, the glasses, and the fine linen, and the hoods, and the veils. All this stuff that they use to try to make themselves attractive with. All these accessories. Huh? You just look at them and say, it's not doing any good. In the place of all that, the Bible says this is what God's going to do with them. These kind of people are not going to be in that city. These kind of women are not going to be in that city. Prideful. It shall come to pass that instead of the sweet smell, there shall be stink. Instead of a girdle of rent, and instead of a well-set hair baldness. Instead of a stomacher. Is that one of them things that y'all hold the fat in with? I mean, I don't know what a stomacher is, but I think it's one of them things you... (laughs) Singes up. I don't know if that's the same thing, but if I interpret the stomacher as the censure, <laughs> Hallelujah. Maybe some of us men need one of them. Shut up, Jeremiah. I mean, no matter what I do. He's always after me about this right here. He said, you got two big ones here and one big one here. (laughs) I need to give me one of them censures, man. (laughs) That's my son. Pray for me. Anyway. Stomacher, <laughs> a girdling of sackcloth and burning instead of beauty. Men, when, you know, ultimately when Babylon takes them, can you imagine these women stripped of all that, all of those accessories? All of that vanity? I mean, their head's been, you know, bald. They got scared. I mean, it's just a mess. They stink. You know, but that's what's coming on these prideful women. This is an end time. This is a day of the Lord message. This is not just to Israel in that day. And it's not just to Jerusalem. It's to the church of the living God. What kind of people are going to be in that city? Women that are godly women. Humble women. Women who have a right spirit. Women who are submissive. And I'm not trying to, you know. Hallelujah. You're the freest women there are. These women get up there and talk about women's liberation. There's no woman freer than a woman of God. There's no woman freer than a holy woman of God. Hallelujah! I better not see you walk by with a stretched out neck with your tail too. If I do, I'm going to say Isaiah 3. <laughs> How did I turn Isaiah into the, I should not do this. This is a serious 
good. <clears throat> Amen? See, instead of beauty. See, what the woman, what God is getting at here is women are supposed to glorify God in their appearance. Hallelujah. It's not about vanity like the world. It's about glorifying God. That's what beautiful is. Somebody said praise the Lord. Okay. But then he says, the men shall fall by the sword and the mighty in the war. And her gates shall lament in the morn and being desolate shall sit upon the ground. But then chapter 4, here we go again. God says, but there's better days coming. There's better days coming. When you get beyond that historical reference after Assyria has gone in or Babylon has gone in, Assyria took the ten tribes, 721 B.C. Babylon, 605 B.C., first deportation. 597 and 587 B.C., three deportations by Babylon. God is saying when you get beyond that, when the women have been balded and everything else, the women, men have died in the sword by the sword, and there's very few men left because of the wars. So many men are going to die that there's not going to be enough men to go around. Some of you think you're already in fulfillment times right now. <laughs> you look around and say, there's not enough women, men to go around for me. You think you're already in Isaiah 4. But in that day, not enough men to go around because they died in war, man. Future time. So many men are going to die. Not enough to go around. And, and so the Bible says seven women will go to one man. <laughs> Hallelujah. I mean, they say, hey, you don't even have to feed us. We'll feed ourselves. We'll support ourselves. Just let us be called by your name. I mean, yeah. we just need a man. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It got so bad after the judgment, there wasn't enough men to go around. And that brings, that's the context of Isaiah 4. But the ultimate context is this. The Bible's talking about in that day, the day of the Lord, seven women shall go to one man. That one man is Jesus Christ. Amen. That one man is the Messiah. It's the deeper meaning. Amen. It's Jesus Christ. That one man is Jesus Christ. And when it says seven women shall go to one man, it's talking about 7,000 years of history of believers that belong to Jesus Christ. Seven women, 7,000 years. It also speaks of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. Those that overcome in that, hallelujah, in those churches will be the bride of Christ. Seven women show, lay hold to one man, Jesus, the seven churches. Are y'all with me here? What a mighty God we serve. What a glorious day. In that day, then this would be the eighth time. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, We will eat of our own bread and wear our own apparel. Only let us be called by Thy name to take away our reproach. So we need an exchange of names. Okay? Now, the historical context, again, is the so many men have died. There's not enough to go around. So seven women say, I'll take your name. If you'll let us take your name, we'll provide for ourselves our own apparel. But ultimately, this is speaking of Jesus Christ. Seven women will lay hold on one man. And they're saying, we just want your name. We just want to be called by your name. And when you say that, I want you to turn to Isaiah 63 and 19. And I want you to understand what that means. When you and I say, I want the name of Jesus, seven women laying hold of one man. What are we saying? When you said, I, when you said yes, uh, woman of God, when you said yes and you got married, and you took the name of your husband, you know what you were saying? 
you said I'll take your name? 63.19 We are thine. Thou never bearest rule over them. They were not called by thy name. The difference is, is there is a church that wants to be called by the name of the Lord. And what you say when you say, I want to be called by the name of the Lord, you say, I want Him to rule my life. I want His headship. People who don't want God to rule their life, if they don't want His headship, should not take His name. And these seven women say to that one man, we'll take care of our own needs, but let us be called by Thy name. We're willing to come under Your authority. I'm preaching to a woman of God tonight as a whole that have been called by the name of the Lord. And you're saying we want to be ruled by Him. So when this marriage takes place, there's an exchange of names. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33 deals with the branch. I don't have time to turn there and read it tonight. Maybe I will in the future. But read Jeremiah 23 and Jeremiah 33 and you will see that the name of the branch is the Lord our righteousness. And then Jeremiah 33, his wife is called the same thing. The Lord our righteousness. So what we have here is an exchange of names. He is the branch, verse 2. Zamak. Look at it. And in that day, now this is the ninth time, shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful. There it is, the branch. That's Messiah. That's the Lord. Zamak. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah 33 talks about the branch. The Lord our righteousness. The wife is called by the same name as her husband. That means they have become one. And so there's coming a day when seven women shall take hold of one man. He said, we'll take care of ourselves, paraphrase, but let us be called by your name. We want to be one with you. You took the name of Jesus. His name is Lord Jesus Christ. You took His name. You're His bride. You are called by the name of Jesus. I'm looking at a man who has the name of Jesus. The bride has the name, the same name as the bridegroom. You said, I want to be under your authority. I want to be under your headship. I want you to rule over me. I tell you, even if I got to take care of myself, I'm willing to do that. I just want to be married. <laughs> now, historically, Maybe some of y'all are there right now. Maybe you're into cutting deals. If you'll marry me, I'll buy my own food. If you'll marry me, I'll go get a job. I'll support you. I just want to be married. Hallelujah. It's not supposed to be like that, right? Amen, amen, amen. In that day, the day of the Lord, the Lord come back, the kingdom. The branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. They're going to have true beauty. They're going to be the bride. The escaped, who is the escaped of Israel? The survivors of the heavenly Mashiach. The survivors of the birth pains of Messiah. The survivors of the tribulation period are those who have survived. Give the Lord praise in the house. Those are the ones that's talking about here. They're going to have true beauty. They're going to be married to Him. Now watch. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion and he that is remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy and everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. Hallelujah. Holy. They're going to be called holy. Lord, our righteousness. Holy. And he says the earth is going to be filled with fruit. What fruit is he talking about? The fruit that the bride produces. Amen. Amen. Those that are married to him. Amen. The fruit that the bride produces along with the bridegroom. Amen. The earth will be filled with the fruit Amen. in that day. Hallelujah, Hallelujah to the Lamb. Amen. It's like a flash of lightning, man. See, he talks about, he brings these charges, you know, and this calamity and these woes and Oh, and then he said, come to me. And then he's showing the glorious future that you can be a part of. And it's like lightning flashing. See what's coming in the future for the righteous? Lightning flashes, man. Amen, amen. It's beautiful. Give God praise in the house. Amen. Now watch. Verse 4, When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughters of Zion, 
and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem from the midst thereof by the spirit of judgment and by the spirit of burning. And the Lord will create upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion and upon her assemblies a cloud and smoke by day and the shining of a flaming fire by night for upon all the glory shall be a defense. He said it's going to be like those days when Israel was protected and provided for in the wilderness. The glory cloud overshadowing them, protecting them. The glory cloud. Can you imagine? But here's what's interesting. When He sets up that glory cloud, it's a canopy. Verse 6, And there shall be a tabernacle for a shadow in the daytime from the heat and for a place of refuge and for a covert from the storm and from the rain. He's telling them this tabernacle is a canopy. He said, what you're going to see is Messiah is married to His bride. And the glory cloud is the wedding canopy. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There she is. There you are. The bride of Christ. In, re in resurrection. In resurrection. In the kingdom, Micah talks about it. He said every person will be under their fig tree. What that means is they made it in the kingdom. They're in the kingdom. They're in the resurrection. Remember Nathaniel, was it Nathaniel? Was that name? In John chapter 1, Nathaniel, Jesus said before, before something. Okay, read it to me. I, read John 1, 51, starting 51. I'm reading it because I want you to see something here. Okay, go. Okay. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Keep reading. And, for, and the third no, day. No, no. Okay, go back up a little bit further on one. Okay. The verse before that. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree. Believest thou? Thou shalt see greater, greater things. things. Than okay, read the verse above it. Okay. Nathan answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King Read of Israel. Read the verse before it. Nathan said unto him, Whence now, whence knowest thou me? Okay, read it again. All Nathan. the way up a little bit further. Sorry. Okay, okay. Verse 47. Yeah. Jesus saw Nathan, Nathaniel, coming to him, coming to him, and whom there was no guile. And whom there was no All guile. right, and the Lord says, okay, as Nathan's making his approach, are y'all with me? He said, I saw you under the fig tree. Amen. Nathan said, what do you mean you saw me under the fig tree? Did you see me when I was a little baby and mama put me under the fig tree when she was keeping the fields? Is that when you saw me? Possible. But no, this is a prophetic symbolism. Being under the fig tree means Jesus said, I saw you in the resurrection. I saw you in the kingdom. Woo. no wonder Nathaniel became a believer because Jesus said I saw you all the way in the future kingdom sitting under your fig tree I saw you in resurrection and so now we see the bride here in Isaiah chapter 4 in the canopy of the hoopah of the Lord Amen. married to the bridegroom hallelujah to the Lamb Amen set apart cleansed set apart holy Chapter 5, I'll just run through it real quickly for you. In chapter 5, there's a song that's sung. It said, I will sing to, sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved. He said, I'm going to sing a song of my well-beloved to my beloved, to my Dodi. The Hebrew word is Dodi. This is talking about the Messiah. The Dodi, the well-beloved, the beloved is God, is Messiah. He said, I'm going to sing you a song. It's the song of the vineyard. Make a long story short. God says, I took care of you. I gave you everything you needed. He took them out of Egypt in captivity. Egypt in bondage brought them into the promised land. Planted them in a fruitful hill. Put a wall around them. Put a watchtower in the midst of them. Amen. Amen. Gave them everything they need. Took the rocks. Removed the rocks. Amen. Fertile soil to grow in. They were a vine planted there by God. 
And the Bible said it came time for God to go and see if there were fruit on the vine. And when he got there, he was expecting to find good grapes, but he found sour grapes. He said they were useless. Can y'all hear me? Okay. Yeah, he said they were useless. Useless. Sour grapes. Not what they should have been. God, God said, after everything I've done for you, and you are sour, nothing but sour grapes. And so as a result of that, then God begins to uh, declare upon them woes and judgments that are going to come. Uh, we see in verse 7, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his pleasant plant. He looked for judgment, but behold, oppression for righteousness, and behold, a cry. In verse 8, we see a woe. Now, this isn't the first woe mentioned in Isaiah. There's two mentioned in chapter 3. But there are six total mentioned in Isaiah 5. Right? Now, basically, chapter 5 is this. What has gone wrong? Why is the judgment of God coming upon? Historically, in their day, in the future day of the Lord, why is all of this happening? What has gone wrong? And so he begins to declare. They add house to house. They join house to house. Field to field. Once again, this has to do with evil in economy. And then after that, it talks about, uh, as a result of that, there's going to be famine in the land. That's found in verse 10. Verse 11, another woe. <clears throat> uh, read verse 11 and 12. They drinking, drinking, partying, staying up all night. Wild music. Are you here? He said, woe to those. They stay up all night, party all night. Hallelujah. And I remember you, some of you, how many of you know, remember you in the world? I used to party all night, man. Drink all night, party all night, wild music all night. Some of you act like that was a long time ago. It hasn't really been that long ago. But you need to thank God. Because there is a woe, there's calamity declared, declared upon that kind of lifestyle. Right? I'll read it to you. Woe unto them that rise up early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, that continue until night, till wine inflame them. And the heart, the vial, the tabret, the pipe, the wine are in their feasts, but they regard not the work of the Lord, neither consider the operation of His hands. Verse 13. Why did it all happen? Therefore my people are gone into captivity because they have no knowledge. Their honorable men are famished, their multitude dried up with thirst. Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure, and their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiced that shall descend into it. And the mean man shall be brought down, the mighty man shall be humbled, and the eyes of the lofty shall be humbled. But the Lord of hosts shall be exalted in judgment. And God that is holy shall be sanctified in righteousness. Then shall the lambs feed after their manner. The waste places of the fat ones shall strangers eat. Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords of vanity and sin as it were with a cart of rope. You know. What that means is that they just can't get enough of sin. You know, okay, do you understand? I know I'm going fast, but I've got to. You know, there's some people when they feel horrible. They, they, they know they failed God. They feel horrible. They repent. They ask God to forgive them. They don't want to do it. But then you've got some people, they live for sin. And they just, they like an, a, a cart, they just pull sin just pull sin to themselves because they can't get enough. And then the Lord said this. These people also talk about, well, let's just see what God's going to do. We don't believe God's going to do anything about it. That's the attitude. So we read it. I'll read it to you. That say, let Him make speed and hasten His work that we may see it. That the counsel of the Holy One of Israel draw nigh and come that we may know it. Let's see if God will do anything about it. Okay, attitude, horrible attitude. Another woe, 20. Woe unto them that call evil good, a good evil, and put darkness for light, and light for darkness. They put bitter for sweet, and sweet for bitter. See, there's going to come a time when people 
are not going to be able to discern between right and wrong. They won't have discernment about what's right or wrong. They call sweet, bitter, bitter, sweet, so on and so forth. No discernment about right, what's right and wrong. Shatoroboko. Woe to them are wise in their own eyes and prudent in their own sight. It's just pride. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, men of strength, mingle strong drink, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteous of the righteous from him. Therefore, as the fire devoureth the stubble and the flame consumeth the chaff, so their roots shall be rottenness and their blossoms shall go up as dust, because they, here we go, they have cast away the law of the Lord of hosts and despise the word of the Holy One of Israel. They have no knowledge because they don't want knowledge. They've cast away the law, the instruction of God away from themselves. And so this is the reason why everything is going like it is. <clears throat> Verse 25, Therefore is the anger of the Lord kindled against this people. He hath stretched forth His hand against them and hath smitten them. The hills did tremble and their carcasses were torn in the midst of the streets for all this his anger is not turned away but his hand is stretched out still and then he talks about the judgment uh, these nations coming the nations in the days of uh, those kings that Isaiah prophesied under Assyria and Babylon the future nations Russia are you with me here Russia end time Assyria terrorist out of Assyria all kinds of wars that will invade into the land in the last days. Verse 26, I'll read it to you. He, lived, he said, He will lift up an ensign to the nation from afar and will hiss unto them from the end, one end of the earth and behold, they shall come with speed swiftly. To hiss is what the beekeeper does anyway. And we'll get into that and we get to the 8th, 8th chapter. Isaiah will see this. He's calling the nations against uh, together ultimately in the war of Armageddon. But you've got many battles in the tribulation period. You've got Rush, Russian invasion. You've got um, uh, the king of Babylon or Assyria, probably some kind of terrorist movement. Maybe even ISIS that's like the Assyrians of that day. Moving and conquering and destroying. All right, And then you have that ultimate war called the War of Armageddon at the end of the day of the Lord before the Lord sets His kingdom up. But... We see these nations coming. God is the one that's bringing them down. Uh, none shall be weary nor stumble among them. None shall slumber nor sleep. Neither shall the girdle of their loins be loosed nor the latch of their shoes be broken. Whose arrows are sharp, all their bows bent. Their horses' hoofs shall be counted like flint. Their wheels like a whirlwind. Their roaring shall be like a lion. They shall roar like young lions. Yea, they shall roar and they lay hold on the prey and shall carry it away swiftly. Away safe and none shall deliver it. And in that day, so that brings me, I think this would be the tenth time. Seven, eight, nine, tenth. Tenth time, the day of the Lord's mention. Verse 30. In that day they shall roar against them like the roaring of the sea. And one look unto the land, behold darkness. One look in the land, behold darkness. And sorrow, the light is darkened in the heavens thereof. Mm. Amen. So the judgment of the nations historically and future. And then the sixth chapter, I won't re-preach it to you because I preached it to you last, last Wednesday as we looked at the call of Isaiah. But in Isaiah 6, when King Uzziah dies, Isaiah said, I saw the Lord also. I saw the Lord also sitting upon a throne high and lifted up and His train filled the temple. This parallels Revelation chapter 4. Revelation 2 and 3 is the churches. Revelation chapter 4, John was caught up in the, in the Spirit on the Lord's day and he saw one sitting upon the throne. It's the same thing, same, basically in the same time frame too as well as Isaiah. In that future time, the Lord sitting upon the throne, governing. Amen. Amen. We see the... Um, Isaiah cries out, Woe is me, am I, I'm un, woe is me, for am I, for I am undone. Right? Amen. My lips are unclean. Amen. Okay. So we see the undone, the unmade, the unclean. Then becomes made clean by the coal off of the altar. That's an altar of judgment. Amen. The outer court. Coals placed on his lips, his sins purged. 
he's cleansed. The unclean becomes cleansed. His lips becomes the altar of praise like the seraphim that he saw. It's no longer me for me. It's me for God. And, and then we see he overhears God say, Whom shall I send? And the prophet says, Here I am. Send me. And prophetically concerning the last days, this is when the end time church, the tribulation saints, are commissioned by God in the tribulation period to go forth. Revelation 4, and then we have the tribulation period following that. We see the saints going forth and being a witness to the one that's sitting upon the throne, calling nations to worship Him. Amen. To go up into that mountain, contrary to, nat to nature, and be in that city. Amen. A righteous people and a holy people. So get ready, in case you don't know it, in the ultimate fulfillment here, this is going to be fulfilled by the end time church. Isaiah is a picture of that end time church going and preaching. And Isaiah says, how long? And to paraphrase it, basically God says, until people don't want to hear it anymore. Until the cities are laid waste. Total destruction. He said, you just keep preaching. Be a witness. Be a light. Hallelujah. Say amen. amen. Please stand. Next Wednesday, I will show you as we get in the 7th chapter, the 8th chapter in the Emmanuel section of Isaiah. When I get in that section, I'm going to show you Isaiah is a picture of right before the tribulation period starts. Uzziah. Uzziah, the king. The last ten kings in Judah cover the seven year tribulation period. Okay, now Uzziah is the king right before the tribulation period. Jotham is the first year. Ahaz is the second year. The seventh uh, chapter of Isaiah, he's going to jump over Jotham and go straight to Ahaz, the second year of the tribulation period. What I'm trying to say to you is when you see prosperity, like was in the land of Israel in the days of Uzziah, powerful army in Israel, when you see these things, it is a sign to let you know that the beginning of the tribulation period is about to start. Okay? Because it is a parallel. The days of Uzziah is a parallel of right before the tribulation. We're living in those days is what I'm trying to tell you now. So we're living in exciting times. Hallelujah. And I'm, I'm thankful to be able to preach the Word of the Lord. And uh, I normally don't read every verse, but these things are so new to us that I think it's important for me to cover the verses and explain uh, what is going on. All right? Hallelujah. So I give God the glory and the honor and the praise. <laughs> Father God, we come before You right now. We thank You for Your blessing. We ask God that You would, as we preach these things concerning the past and things concerning the future and things concerning the present, the Father God, we will make the choices necessary to be a, a righteous bride, a holy bride, a godly bride. Let us not behave like they did so badly. Why things went so bad and so wrong for them. You have promised a glorious future to us, Lord. We thank You, God, for Your presence that we live in right now. Continual presence. We enjoy. We rejoice. We desire Your Word. We desire to be instructed. We desire to know You and to live for You. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed in the name of the Lord.